Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, the, I guess, second annual virtual happy hour that the Benji Brooks Committee is putting on. Um, we're all a little more Zoom savvy this time, which is uh, hopefully pretty good. We welcome everybody. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Mary Brandt, who's gonna start with a reflection to start our night off. Well, I, I, I'm delighted to be here. And I think that it's important that we all recognize um, that we have had a, a loss in our community this week. And I think it, we have to take a moment to acknowledge and bear witness to our pain, our confusion, the questions that are coming up, uh, and the suffering that, that many of us are experiencing, and some very intensely, and some just as members of our community. Um, there is a request for privacy and respect, and we must honor that, even in our breakout discussions and everything else tonight. Um, but I thought it was very, very important that we take a moment together to be present and to bear witness to each other and to our community where we can find peace and comfort. And so we're gonna start for a moment. I just want everyone to put their hand on their heart. And we're going to experience just a moment together of silence of being present and of breathing together. Know that all across the country your friends and colleagues are breathing with you and holding you in their hearts. We have such a focus on our individual achievement and our individual responsibilities that we do forget sometimes that we're a community. And in the African philosophy of Ubuntu, this is expressed as I am because we are. You are because we are. So we acknowledge together before we start this wonderful time together that we as a community create and sustain a web of life and love. We weave that web together and it is a web that is strong enough to support our sorrows and our joys. So I celebrate us together and I celebrate this wonderful organization and the time we're gonna to spend tonight. And I honor and bear witness to everything else that we're experiencing together as a community. And now I can't wait to hear from everybody because they've got some great stories together. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brandt, um, for those um, really um, important words. Um, and uh, we're grateful that you are joining us this evening. We'd actually now like to all welcome you to our annual APSA Benji Brooks networking event. Dr. Benji Brooks earned her MD from UT Galveston in 1948 accepted residencies at the University of Pennsylvania, Boston Children's Medical Center, and the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Glasgow. She briefly practiced in Boston as the first woman hired by the Harvard Medical School Surgery Department. She then returned home to become the first woman pediatric surgeon in Texas, where she worked at Texas Children's Hospital and St. Joseph's Hospital in Houston. She later founded the Pediatric Surgery Department at UT Houston. She was a true pioneer in pediatric surgery and serves as an inspiration and role model for those who follow in her footsteps. 
The Benji Brook Committee is named in her honor with the goal of educating, inspiring, and supporting women pediatric surgeons to realize their personal and professional goals and to serve the pediatric surgery community in addressing the issues inherent to training and practice in maintaining a diverse and balanced workforce. Tonight, we welcome three amazing pediatric surgeons who are truly legendary in our field and exemplify Dr. Brooks' legacy, as well as the aims of this organization. Dr. Marion Henry, Dr. Erica Newman, and Dr. Gail Besner will each speak about how they have successfully overcome and achieved throughout their careers. Following these talks, there will be a 15 minute live Q&A session, followed by a networking hour of breakout rooms. We are so happy and delighted to have each of our speakers here tonight, and we hope you all enjoy the session. If you have any questions, we'll be addressing them at the end, but please feel free to put them in the chat box. So we'll start with Dr. Henry. Dr. Marion Henry is a professor of surgery at the University of Chicago, having recently moved there from the University of Arizona in Tucson. She completed her medical school at Stanford University, her general surgery residency at Yale University, and her pediatric surgery fellowship training at the National Children's Medical Center in Washington, DC. Dr. Henry also has a master's in public health degree from Yale University. A former commander in the US Navy, Dr. Henry served as the ship's surgeon on the aircraft carrier, the USS Carl Vinson, the chief of pediatric surgery at Naval Medical Center San Diego, and the director for surgical services during Pacific Partnership 2015 on the USNS Mercy. While at the Naval Medical Center San Diego, she was also the surgery clerkship director, chair of the General Surgery Program Evaluation Committee, command intern advisor, and program director of the Trent or the, of the Transitional Year Internship Program. At the University of Arizona, Dr. Henry was an Assistant Program Director for the General Surgery Residency Program and Course Director for the Surgery Residency Prep Course. She was faculty for the MS1 and MS2 Clinical Reasoning Course and the Global Health Course. She also served on the Tucson Education Policy Committee for the College of Medicine and the Dean's Council on Faculty Affairs. Dr. Henry is very active nationally in pediatric surgery and in surgical advocacy. She is chair of the Publications Committee for the Association of Women Surgeons, past chair of the Advocacy Committee, and current chair of the Benji Brooks Women's Committee of the American Pediatric Surgical Association, and is the APSA delegate to the American College of Surgeons Board of Governors. She's an active member of the Gun Violence Prevention Collaborative and Doctors for America. Dr. Henry is passionate about medical education, mentorship, and coaching, faculty development, diversity, equity, and inclusion in surgical advocacy. Her new role at the University of Chicago, I'm sorry, in her new role at the University of Chicago, she is eager to focus on addressing the gun violence pandemic in the United States through collaborative approaches at prevention, response, and recovery, while also addressing inequities in the healthcare system. Dr. Henry, we're very excited to have you and look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Rich. And um, I apologize to my other two co-presenters because I told them I wouldn't do my do this with my slides, but I think I will get lost if I don't use my photo props. <laughs> so I've gotten their permission to go ahead and share my screen and, and share my slides. Um, and I'm very honored to be with you tonight. I uh, don't actually consider myself an expert enough to, um, to share with you uh, any particular words of advice, but I do want to just share a little bit of my journey. And really, it is a journey um, that has been empowered by members of this community. And I hope that you will get that out of um, this talk tonight. So uh, this is just lessons I've learned on my journey, which has been um, Perhaps not a not a straightforward one always, and that's really what I want to want to share with everyone. Um, so, for those of you who were able to attend the APSA fiftieth meeting in person and have Adam and hear Adam Foss speak, um, that was a really influential time for me. And one of the key takeaways that I got out of that that talk was that as you embark on reflecting on your journeys and reflecting on what we do with our lives, we have to recognize our privilege. And I wanna start actually by recognizing the privilege I have to get to where I am today. Um, and that starts with recognizing that 
I had uh, two parents who raised me and I had a mother who taught in a school so that her children could all get excellent education free um, all the way through. And so that is where I start my personal story is to recognize that I came I came to my journey with quite a lot of privilege behind me. And I knew that I always wanted to go into medicine. It was my North Star, I don't know why, uh, but it always was. And before I started medical school, I decided that I really uh, wanted also to, um, to give back, to give back to my country, to give back in some way, to recognize perhaps this privilege, though I didn't realize that or have those words in my mind at the time. And so I joined the military and I was fortunate enough to go to medical school on a military scholarship. And I thought that I would be doing that um, towards a, a career in family practice or in pediatrics maybe. Um, and I really was looking forward to a journey of leadership, a journey of uh, travel. Um, and then I fell in love with surgery. And that was a problem because that didn't really fit into this plan of being a military uh, doctor and uh, what I was going to do. And thankfully, I had some incredible mentors in medical school. And I, I've tried to recognize people who've lifted me along the way in this journey uh, on these slides. And they showed me that that surgery did, could fit in with my goals, that they would support me despite any challenges that the military would throw my way. And um, so Dr. Crummel was the first person uh, I approached actually when I decided I thought I wanted to be a surgeon and maybe even a pediatric surgeon. And he's the one who sent me down to Larry Moss's office um, in what was then the basement of Packard Hospital and started my research trajectory with, with Dr. Moss. I immediately was taken to outcomes research and thought, oh, this is great. I wanna take some extra time and do some research. And this is sort of the first obstacle thrown my way. I applied for and, and was awarded a Howard Hughes Fellowship and the military said, nope, sorry, you cannot have an extra year. You are, you need to graduate in four years. So this was sort of the first bump along the road of, uh, I actually, you know, really want to pursue this thing and maybe I, maybe I, maybe I can't. Um, luckily that didn't deter me away from surgery and with the support of Dr. Moss and Dr. Crummel and Dr. Curet and Dr. Wren, I, I continued on and, and I matched in general surgery and I was uh, fortunate enough that I was allowed to continue at Stanford um, to do my general surgery residency. And then one year into my residency, Dr. Moss moved to Yale. <laughs> um, and so now I was looking at my research years and my mentor had moved across the country and what would I do? So that was um, sort of pearl number two was that sometimes you have to make some really hard choices and they might, uh, upset or anger people uh, who are your, your bosses, your mentors, um, your uh, supporters. But as Dr. Crummel said to me at the time when we were discussing this, sometimes you have to do what is right for you and what is not necessarily right for those around you. And so I moved across the country to continue my research and my residency and finished at Yale. And thank goodness I did because I met my husband. Um, and so sometimes, you know, things happen for a good reason. Um, I also had my son while I was there and this was kind of crisis number, I don't know, two or three at this point because having Jack was one of those times where really my whole North Star suddenly started spinning and I wasn't sure what was now the direction I just I was in my uh, sixth year of residency. I'd spent two years in the lab doing pediatric surgery. I was about to apply for fellowship and um, I suddenly had this bundle of energy and joy and I didn't know if I could do this and be a mom and be a pediatric surgeon and whether this was still my right direction. And thankfully, um, 
I had a couple people and one of them, you know, Dr. Katz, I didn't even know at the time. Um, she, uh, but I, through Dr. Hollins was, was sort of um, pointed to a, a listserv that supported women surgeons and women pediatric surgeons. And she reached out when I sort of had my crisis of, can I continue on this pathway? and was so supportive and so wonderful just in talking about her own journey and her own family and experience that um, that I thought, okay, I can pursue this. Um, so onward on the journey, it was perhaps not the most auspicious beginning to my Navy career when this is where I was sent as a general surgeon straight out of residency. This is a uh, Joshua Tree National Park, and I was sent to the middle of the desert to be a Navy surgeon for a year out of fellowship. And this was, again, a little bump along the road where uh, I really didn't want this obstacle. I wanted to go straight to fellowship, um, like many of our residents uh, out there do. But the military once again said, nope, that's not your path. Um, so out I went to uh, 29 Palms, California, to be a general surgeon for the Marines. But it was a good place. We did, we did start to fall in love with the desert actually and recognize some of the beauty of the desert. And it was a good place to end time to expand our family. And so although it wasn't really a planned year in my grand scheme of, of my life in, in what to do, uh, we made it work and we took, we took opportunities. Thankfully, I did match and went on to fellowship in Washington, D.C., and there I had some incredible mentors, and we lived just around the corner from the National Cathedral, and I think about the cathedral a lot at that time, as well as sort of in a daily, uh, maybe not daily, but often in my career, about how it, it impacts what we're doing, and I think about the builders of a cathedral who work for decades to build this structure and they may never see the completed structure. And I think about our careers and we work day after day, year after year to improve the field of pediatric surgery. And we may never see the final product. Hopefully we don't ever see the final product because we never want to be done in that improvement. Um, but uh, you know, the wonderful mentors I had in fellowship, I still hear their voices in my head uh, very frequently as, as I continue on. Following, uh, well, and, you know, how do you survive fellowship while well, your co-fellows get you through? As uh, Dr. Slidell said to me uh, just earlier today, you know, we have a friendship that was uh, about a, a bond that was uniquely formed in the crucible of fellowship. <laughs> and I think that that is true. So, you know, the people you go through fellowship with will forever be um, some of, you know, your closest friends, hopefully closest supporters and closest advisors. And I definitely feel that way about both uh, Wolfgang Stair and Mark Slidell, my junior and senior fellow. Um, and I have called on them and relied on them for the many years after fellowship. Uh, when it came time to leave fellowship, I was a military surgeon and I didn't really have a choice of where I went. And honestly, San Diego was not my first choice. Um, I was really hoping to stay in DC. We'd made wonderful friends. We'd established our family there. My children were in good schools there. I really wanted to stay, but that was not what the Navy had planned for me. So off I went to San Diego and, um, became a military surgeon. Um, a military career is an interesting one in pediatric surgery. It's not the busiest or most complex pediatric surgical practice. So this is another challenge. Um, but I, this is where you have to take opportunities that are presented to you and uh, uh, bloom where you are planted. I was very fortunate to have one of the best partners out there in all of pediatric surgery. Um, I didn't get to choose him. He got stuck with me. I hope uh, it's a mutual respect and partnership, but Dr. Ignacio uh, could not have been a better, a better partner. And we were very fortunate to train some amazing military 
residents and uh, some who go on to uh, careers in pediatric surgery as well. Um, but as I said, it was not what one would kind of expect or hope for coming out of fellowship. Not a whole lot of complex cases, not a, a ton of, court, of uh, cases. So you have to make of the situation the best. And that's what I did that, you know, took advantage of opportunities that presented themselves. I couldn't become a program director in surgery since Dr. Ignacio already had that job. So I became the intern class advisor and then the transitional year program director. I became the director for surgical services, leading this incredible directorate on, on that in amazing hospital ship on a mission to uh, Oceania and Southeast Asia with Pacific Partnership 2015. These experiences let me grow my educational portfolio and my, my um, opportunities to grow as an educator and also my leadership uh, opportunities. To lead a directorate made up of military, uh, civilian NGOs, foreign, uh, foreign, med foreign doctors, foreign medical teams was really a, a unique and incredible opportunity um, that gave me, I think, uh, a very unique leadership experience. And where else do you get to go to clinic? On a helicopter. But the military was also, also proved to uh, throw some of my greatest challenges at me. It was not easy to leave these three for six months and uh, to return home on my daughter's four, fourth birthday there was quite a, an experience. I was very fortunate um, during my time in the military to find some additional mentors. And this was something I sought out um, directly because of having not as many within the military um, that I might find. So for those of you who find yourself in a place where you might not have the mentors or role models that you um, hope to have, you need to go looking for them. And so Dr. Danielle Wash, I met through the AWS Women in Surgical Committee, Dr. Celeste Hollins, I'd already met, but she helped me become very active in AWS. And Dr. Mary Fallett, uh, I adopted through, uh, through uh, working with Romeo as a mentor, and she got me active in APSA. And then uh, Dr. Langham and Dr. Herschel really helped nurture my interest and enthusiasm for health policy and advocacy. But things had to change. And sometimes uh, this will say, uh, there comes a time in every life when the past recedes and the future opens. It's that moment when you turn to face the unknown, some will turn back to what they already know and some walk straight ahead into uncertainty. I can't tell you which to do, but I can tell you which is more fun. So I took these three away from the ocean and headed out to the desert and in Arizona became the uh, a division chief for a non-existent division of pediatric surgery and spent uh, several years trying to build that division. Um, I was fortunate to become very active in education there and have the mentorship of two incredible leaders while I was there. And it was there that I realized another, um, Another uh, sort of truth is that you have to be flexible and find the opportunities because again, things were not exactly as I expected when I got there. And I was fortunate to really become involved in the School of Medicine and grow my career through doing that. I will say I had amazing support from my leaders there and that really helped in terms of moving up in academic um, in my academic rank and which helped me when it was time to move on. 2020 was a very hard year as everybody I'm sure knows. And that really led to some soul searching. My children in particular really missed the San Diego water. And I actually went to a coach and um, I, I actually started a coaching program to become a coach, but I also had a personal coach. And they really got me thinking about, well, what is your why? And why are you here? And what do you want to do? And I reflected back to the APSA talk by Adam Foss of using your sword and your shield. And I really realized that 
I didn't want to do the easy things. I didn't want to stay where I was and be comfortable and just keep going sort of day after day with what was around me. But I really wanted to tackle this question of gun violence and healthcare disparities. And that is why I moved to Chicago. I was fortunate enough to have the support of Dr. Kandel and Dr. Jeff Matthews to bring this idea. And, um, and that is where I am. So my few takeaways are to be flexible, to look for the opportunities and take advantage of them, even if they are the hard things and not the easy things, to acknowledge your privilege and to use your sword and your shield. And we are a family who are supported by so many. These are my supporters. Again, my pediatric surgical family who I grew up with, the mentors and supporters who have brought me along the way and the family I fall back to when I struggle and have these challenges and we all struggle. And I just want to say again that uh, without each other, we, I would not have achieved what I have. So I've spoken too long and I need to turn over and let my uh, co-speakers also speak, but thank you for letting me share my journey. Thank you so much, Dr. Henry. That was really wonderful and lots of good tips and advice for all of us. Um, we'll uh, save questions for the end. Um, and I am very excited to introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Erica Newman. Uh, Dr. Erica Adams Newman is a tenured associate professor of surgery in the section of pediatric surgery and surgical director of the Mott Solid Tumor Oncology Program at the University of Michigan Medical School. She completed undergraduate work and medical school at Georgetown University in 2001. Dr. Newman completed general surgery training at the University of Michigan and fellowship training at the University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital in 2010. She's an active member of the Children's Oncology Group, the American Pediatric Surgical Association, the Society of Black Academic Surgeons, and the Association for Academic Surgery. She is the inaugural chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee of the American Pediatric Surgical Association. Dr. Newman is an associate editor for the American Journal of Surgery and serves on the editorial board of the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. She is the vice chair for faculty development in the Department of Surgery and the associate chief clinical officer for health equity for Michigan Medicine. She is also currently the program director for the Pediatric Surgery Fellowship Training Program. She has established a basic science laboratory focusing on developing modern cancer xenograph models and understanding tumor specific DNA repair mechanisms as novel therapeutic options for pediatric neuroblastoma. Dr. Newman maintains a busy clinical practice in pediatric surgery and is the founder and surgical director of the Mott Solid Tumor Oncology Program, a multidisciplinary program that provides comprehensive care for children with pediatric cancer. Dr. Newman is also a founding member of the Michigan Women's Surgical Collaborative, a diverse group of academic surgeons with the mission of implementing strategies that advance women surgeons across surgical disciplines. Dr. Newman is the vice chair for faculty development in the Department of Surgery at the University of Michigan. Recently, Dr. Newman has agreed to serve in the important leadership role of Associate Chief Clinical Officer for Health Equity. In this position, she assures, assures that all Michigan Medical Group's practice standards and delivery decisions are implemented in ways that address health inequities and disparities. We are very excited to welcome Dr. Newman as one of our speakers tonight, and we look forward to your discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And um, Marion influenced me, and so Dr. Bezer and I are going to have a couple slides just just of pictures as well. So let me just um, share my screen. So thank you. This is such such a privilege and an honor just to spend time together, um, particularly after the year, the month, you know, and the week that we've had. And Dr. Brandt, thank you for, as usual, you are such an inspiration. And I just, I value your insight and just your warmth and your, and your just everything that you've um, given to us and particularly tonight. Um, I started, I put this slide up, this uh, picture here, um, just because I think that this picture um, is really my, my roots. It, it really inspires me. Um, 
this is a picture of my mom here in the middle. And my mom had three brothers. Um, these are her brothers. And the rest of the children are um, my grandmother's sisters and brothers. Um, my grandmother and her two sisters, um, their children. My grandmother and her two sisters married three brothers. And so um, our family is very confusing because they are, um, you know, it's like they're double cousins. And when she was 14, my grandmother uh, got married and her sister was 16 and her older sister was 18. And they grew up in Selma, Alabama. And none of them um, went, were able to go to school. They, my grandmother um, who lives with me now tells me stories about the nurse practitioners used to come to her house and they taught them how to um, read and write. And they were really, this um, community of nurse practitioners um, were really kind and, and helpful to my grandmother and her siblings in teaching them um, manners and uh, how to write and read and gave them, you know, clothing. And it's really, um, you know, to hear her journey, I sometimes feel um, bad and inadequate when I complain <laughs> about mine uh, because she had almost no opportunities for um, even an education in America. But for some reason, she had this vision that she wanted her kids to be educated. She said that her, the nurse practitioners used to tell her, you know, the, the only reason that y'all are poor is because y'all can't go to school. And so she thought, man, if I could, if I could just get my kids educated, then, um, you know, we could, we wouldn't be, you know, we would have means. And so eventually they migrated up north. Um, my grandmother and the sisters and the brothers and all these children. <laughs> and, um, they moved to Gary, Indiana. And I, I always thought, why in the world did y'all move to Gary, Indiana? But turns out, I guess back then in the 1940s, uh, the steel industry was booming and people were moving either to Pittsburgh or to Gary because why the men um, could get a good job. And so my grandfather and mo um, all of my uncles got jobs um, in the steel industry and the women worked in the hospitals. So my great-grandmother, my grandmother um, all worked in the local hospital. My grandmother was an x-ray tech, got a job as an x-ray technician. Um, my grandmother worked in the laundry. One of the sisters worked in um, the OR, was a tech. And so it was as if we were always thinking and talking and working in hospitals. And I think that has, um, you know, very early on had me um, very interested in working in, in healthcare and in medicine. I, it was almost as if it was such a natural thing to do because all of my, my aunts and my grandmother and my mom eventually um, worked in the hospital. My mother was a uh, EKG technician and I, have, I can recall going to work with her um, on a Saturday um, and being able to just sit in an office and, and wait for her to be finished working. I have those really clear, vivid memories. Um, and my mom was um, very, um, for, had this insight that if you can, um, be, because by the way, my grandmother's, the expectation was that they would all graduate from high school. That was her thing. She said, you are gonna be educated. That means you'll graduate from high school. And so they all did all the, the brothers and the sisters and the cousins, they all graduated from high school. And then their goal was, okay, y'all, this next generation got to go to college. And so my mother was so strict on me. I had to make all A's. I could not, um, you know, a C was like the end of the world. Um, and I guess I should say before I was born, she met this man who was my dad and they were very young. He, she was 20 and he was 21. Um, and they, from what, I, what I'm told, um, fell in love and um, were in a relationship and they both wanted to go to college. Actually, my dad did go away um, for two years um, to uh, Lincoln University, which is at HBCU in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, my mom stayed home and started college but when she was, um, during her first year, she got pregnant. 
And I, I hear that in the house between my, my grandmother, uh, that was like World War um, III because she was so upset with my mother for getting pregnant with me. Um, but they, my mom kept going to school. My dad kept going to school. However, tragedy did hit. Um, my dad, when I was three, um, was, was found, um, was murdered um, and was found um, at my grandmother's house. And we, I don't know a lot of the details around it. I used to ask a lot of questions when I was growing up because I was so curious about it because I remember him. I remember his face. This is, you know, him when I was a, probably about um, three and I just remember his expressions and um, how soft-spoken he was and how kind he's, you know, he was to us. Um, and my, the, the details around it are, are just not clear, but um, for, for um, many, the years after that, um, it was just my mom and I, she never had any other kids, she never had any other children and she never remarried. Um, so we, uh, when my dad passed, it was as if my mom just doubled down. She was really, really um, tough on me. Uh, Gary was just at that point getting, I think we were like the murder cop capital. Um, and I though was, very shielded from all of that um and a lot all that had to do with my mom and how she was raising me um i ran track uh she said you know you got to go to college and you have to be an athlete that's how we're going to pay for it and that's how you're going to go to a good college and mm -hmm. she was um she was right i was fortunate enough to um earn a scholarship to Georgetown University for undergrad. And it was there really that my life changed. Um, the people that I met there, the coaches, the professors, my girlfriends that were my roommates really shaped, I think, many of my, um, the drive I have, you know, I, I think a lot of it was kind of going through my high school was that if you ever seen the movie, uh, Lean On Me, that was East Side High. We were a mirror image at West Side High. It was it was tough, and it was tough getting out of there. Eighteen people in my high school went to college, in my class. Um, but my mom, but but when I got to and so I came out to Georgetown and I was a scrappy, you know, <laughs> I was a scrappy girl from you know sk tall skinny scrappy girl from the hood for real. Um, but Georgetown really um, shaped me and they pol it polished me. And I got to see people and things that, you know, I'd never experienced. And I will say every person in my high school was a black person. And so just like those people that come to college, I met people in college that said, I never met a black person until I met you. And I say, well, I never met a white person until I met you. Um, and that was um, life changing for me. Um, and mostly because of these women, um, if, if you all followed the elections, you, you'll, you'll, you may have heard about Kamala Harris and her sorority sisters. That is, that is real, it's meaningful. These women, um, I met um, most of them when I was 17 years old, when I got on campus at Georgetown. And we went through those years together. Um, and looking at this picture, you know, it just brings me to tears. It, the, there's a poem that comes to mind that we used to say, you know, when we, when um, you, you had to memorize the poem as you were going through the initiation process. Um, it's the poem Invictus. I don't know if you all have heard it before. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable, unquittable soul. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And I, I, I pledged this sorority, um, you know, almost 30 years ago, spring of 1991, and I remember that, and it, I will tell you that carries me um, through some of the dark moments even now. And these women too, my grandmother. So this is a picture of my grandmother, my dad's mom, uh, my daughter, Gabby, um, and me. And so when my parents, um, um, I will say when I was a medical student, I'm sorry, um, my mom had, was um, complaining of some pain in her leg 
and um, turned out she had, um, over, for, for a year she was having pain and we didn't really know exactly what was going on, but we knew some, there was something. I was in um, starting my first year in med school and so she was in Gary and I was at NDC um, and she was going back and forth to the doctors and they never could figure out what was going on. They were x-raying her knee, x-raying her hip. A year later, um, she collapsed in the bathroom and couldn't walk and my grandmother found her and turned out she had a metastatic cancer. They did not know um, what the original source was. We never found a primary. And so um, she survived a year uh, from, from the time that she was diagnosed. I can tell you, and I, I, I think about my mom uh, every day, that has been the challenge and it, it still is the challenge of my life. I never thought that I would be navigating, um, you know, medical school, becoming a doctor, having children without my parents and without my mom. Um, and so, you know, when you think about your journey, we all have our challenges, right? I mean, everybody has something that they have to, you know, that that's painful, that, you know, we have to overcome to, to keep going. And for, for me, it's, it definitely is the, um, you know, sort of that, the, the, the emptiness that I have for, for my parents and, and even for siblings. I remember I used to beg my mom, will you have a baby? She was like, girl, I ain't having no babies. You're enough for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wish, man, if, if my mother would have had, you know, a baby, I would have, I would have had, you know, a sibling or someone, but these women, you know, really were my sisters and I have my work sisters now. And so again, so fortunate even, um, you know, and, but, but just when we think about, you know, pain and, and things that we have to overcome, um, we, we all have them. When I was in medical school, um, I met my husband, Robert. Um, he was in law school and I was in med school and we were connected somewhat on a blind date. And I will say again, this is one of those things that this he, it's, it's been a pure joy. You know, he, he really came into my life about two years after I lost my mom and was the solid, just the solid rock. Um, I was a third year medical student and I was like, I'm going to be a surgeon. I don't want to date anybody. I might be going, I want to go to one of the best programs. And what does that mean? Like, what are you going to do? And he go, I'm coming with you. And so, you know, sure enough. Um, he did, and he's been right here um, through it all. I decided to go into surgery um, because when I was um, a medical student, my um, my um, I had a I had a nursing degree. My undergraduate degree was in uh, nursing, and I did the nursing pre med program from Georgetown. And I was just drawn to surgery. I loved everything about it. I loved the instruments. I loved the, um, the sterility and the, um, just the order of the operating room. And it, it was such a calming, um, it has such a calming effect on me and still does. So decided to go into surgery. I matched uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, went there uh, for, um, eight, for seven, um, seven years for general surgery training. Um, and, you know, when I was in the lab, I thought, and I always wanted to do um, pediatric surgery, even when I was a medical student. And I think it was because I was a PICU nurse at DC Children's. Um, and those women in the, um, in the PICU took care of me. They, the nurses became my closest friends. They were, they kept me working while I was um, in medical school. Um, I found out my mom had passed away when I was doing a shift um, at DC Children's and they put completely, you know, just held space for me for many, many months and the, the, my last two years of, of uh, medical school. And so ped surgery was really always, um, you know, something that I was interested in. I, it was a way for me to combine um, peds and um, my nursing background. But when I had, but during my research years, um, I had my daughter, Gabby, and I took one look at the child and said, I cannot, how could I ever leave this baby? I cannot do a fellowship. And I started to think maybe I could do or be happy doing something else. And so I thought I was considering going into surgical oncology. Um, and uh, I was 
set on that until my fourth, um, my last rotation, my fourth year, I was on the pediatric surgery service with um, Dr. Herschel and Dr. Teitelbaum and uh, Sean McLean was my um, chief, was my um, fellow. And the um, senior fellow had already left to go get his, do his job, his first job. And I was at, performing as the junior fellow and it was amazing. And it was completely just one of the most, and I still remember that one of the best experiences I've had. Um, and I had already missed the match because I wasn't going into pediatric surgery. I was gonna do Sir Jock. And um, I remember emailing Dr. Herschel saying, what should someone do if they miss the match? And he emails me back right away, who wants to know? And I said, um, I ended up meeting with him and he, I showed, I shared with him all my fears. I was going to want to be a mom, a good mom. I wanted to be a good wife. I didn't want to get a divorce. I wanted all the things and I wanted to be there for my kids. So to make a long story short, he said, you know, I can't make any promises. He basically, he said, well, you can have all that and be a pediatric surgeon. I do. And, and shared with me stories about his kids and his family and others on the service did too, Dr. Teitelbaum, Dr. Geiger. Um, and they um, said, you know, I, he said, I have a friend named Don Liu and he is just starting his fellowship in Chicago. Now I can't make any promises, but I can get you an interview. So I went and interviewed um, with Don and uh, Mindy and um, I was offered um, to do to be the second fellow in Chicago. Grace Mack was my a senior fellow, and you know we went there and had an amazing time training. Don became one of my closest friends, my confidant, my mentor, um, my biggest huge cheerleader and supporter. And people, if you know him, you you know that this is true about him. Um, in 2012. Um, and so then I finished my fellowship in 2010 and returned to Michigan um, and joined the faculty. In 2012, we lost Don. Um, we, he drowned in uh, Lake Michigan saving two kids. And this again um, has been really a challenge uh, for, for, for me and of course for others, most, mostly his family. Um, you know, when you have a close mentor and, and and they and they pass away you know nobody tells you how to how to deal with that and how to navigate that and I remember when I used to call him driving home saying you know oh can I tell you about this great case and you know something's happening can you give me some advice and so again just challenges to navigate I um, have devoted my career to studying um, cancer and I'm going to finish up because I think I'm over time but um, you know, I, I think the thing that if I could give advice on, on this is that, um, you know, we often think that, you know, the things that we're doing, um, this, you have this feeling, at least I do, um, that we're not good enough. And so I spent a lot of time just trying to, um, just trying to overcome that, right? I mean, we are good enough, all of us, like we made it here to become a pediatric surgeon, you know, you have to... <laughs> This is not, uh, you know, you've, you've had to go through some, some things, you know how to overcome, we know how to navigate. And so I, I just want to say that, you know, we are good enough. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying that out loud, because, you know, it's something that I tell myself. And these are my partners. Um, I will finish with this slide. Uh, the people, you know, on, on, on here are really my family. Uh, at home, at, at home, I have my family. I have two kids, uh, Gabriella and Grayson, and then I have my work family. Um, I will say um, we are learning still, and we're all on a journey. But let's embrace our work families. Um, you know, we we this is hard. This work that we're doing, our patients are complex. They're sick. It's stressful. Um, but when we and we spend a lot of time at work. And so I, we work really hard at staying close. And I just wanna say, let's keep working at it. Um, let's keep loving on each other um, and, 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 and just being there and having each other's back. So I'll finish up there. Thank you so much for allowing me to share and go back down memory lane. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Newman, and um, that was wonderful. 
thanks both Dr. Henry and Dr. Newman, such wonderful um, pearls uh, that I know we're all gonna really um, have a lot to think about. Our last speaker um, is uh, Dr. Gail Besner. Uh, Dr. Gail Besner is a surgeon scientist at Nationwide Children's Hospital and the Ohio State University and holds the H. William Clatworthy Jr. Chair in Surgery and has been the Chief of Pediatric Surgery at Nationwide Children's Hospital for the past 10 years. She's a member of the Center for Perinatal Research at the Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital. She was the program director of the Pediatric Surgery Residency Training Program for many years and now serves as the associate program director. Dr. Besner established a basic science research laboratory in pediatric surgery at Nationwide Children's Hospital upon her arrival. And her research has received continuous funding from the NIH for the past 27 years. Her research focuses on identifying novel therapeutic strategies to protect the intestine from necrotizing enterocolitis, as well as the production of tissue-engineered intestine. Dr. Besner received her undergraduate degree from Cornell University and her medical degree from the University of Cincinnati. She did her general surgery residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and her pediatric surgery training at Buffalo Children's Hospital. She completed her research training in the laboratory of Dr. Judah Folkman, during which time she discovered a new growth factor known as heparin binding EGF-like growth factor. She particip participates actively on many national surgical and research committees. She previously ser served a four-year term as a member of the Surgery, Anesthesia, and Trauma Study Section of the NIH, and a four-year term as a member of the National Advisory General Medical Council of the NIH. Dr. Besner has made important contributions in both the clinical and basic science arenas. She is the author of more than 210 peer-reviewed and peer-reviewed papers and has delivered over 500 local, national, and international presentations. We are honored to have Dr. Besner be our final speaker of our evening tonight. Dr. Besner. Um, I hope you guys can see my screen, can you? Okay, thanks. Well, thank you for that introduction. And I just wanted to thank Mary Brandt for her opening comments, which were really touching and so important to all of us. And um, to the previous speakers for sharing all of their incredibly inspiring stories. Um, it's, in, it's really meaningful and so important that we hear what each other has gone through in order to get where we are today. So I thought tonight I would just briefly share a few examples of instances of bias, of the importance of mentorship, of overcoming challenges, and the importance of taking chances. So um, this picture is of my father, uh, Dr. Aaron Besner. He was a nuclear physicist. Uh, he lived in New York City, and he worked for a, a a company called Walter Kitty Nuclear Laboratories. And his project in the laboratory was to build an atomic powered locomotive. And these were in the days before the dangers of radiation exposure were even known or recognized. And he was exposed to radiation in the workplace um, and he developed leukemia um, from which he succumbed. And I never knew him because he died when I was nine months old. But I believe that he somehow left me with this burning desire and real passion for research. And I carried that with me from a very young age. So I was raised by my mother, a single mother in New York City. And I distinctly remember when I was in high school saying to her, that I wanted to be a scientist. And I can only imagine what she must have thought because she had lost her husband to the field of science, but she took it very well. And she told me that she thought that um, doing research is absolutely wonderful, but it would be also really important to go to medical school. The reason being, because that's the only way you'll know and understand what the problems are that people face medically so that you can do meaningful research. And my mother had no medical background whatsoever, but she was describing a physician scientist before the term was even known. 
And I took her advice and I never looked back. And, um, you know, as you heard Erica say there, a day doesn't go by when I don't think about my mother. So um, I went to Cornell University and when I was a new faculty member at Cornell, I um, joined the laboratory of Dr. Virginia Udermullen, who was a relatively new faculty member at Cornell. And the first paper on my CV is a paper from doc Dr. Udermullen's laboratory. And I remember sitting at my computer in 2018 preparing a talk. And I looked at my screen and I saw this email from Dr. Udermullen sent on January 22nd of 2018. And it said, I've been following your career since you graduated for, from Cornell with great joy. I've been invited to give a talk at my 50th medical school reunion at Columbia that I am titling Adventures of a Pre-Med Advisor. Would like to say something about how you got into medical school and to show how you've succeeded since, despite that abominable letter from your HCEC interviewer, hope this will be okay with you. I was really you know, thrilled to get this email from her and it was wonderful to touch base again, but I really didn't know what um, HCEC even was. So I had to go to the Cornell website and I learned that it was the Health Careers Evaluation Committee. So I wrote back and I said, absolutely wonderful to hear from you. I often think fondly back to the days when you accepted me into your research laboratory. It was my first real introduction to research, which has remained a crucial component of my career ever since. Please feel free to mention me in your 50th medical school reunion. And then I couldn't help but asking, would you mind clarifying for me the abominable letter from my health careers evaluation committee interviewer? And what I really thought was, you know, I was getting older at the time. She must be really, really old at the time. And she must have just forgot, you know, uh, gotten mixed up. But she emailed me back and she said that abominable letter was one that was sent to medical schools. If you remember, most schools had turned you down. At University of Cincinnati, you were waitlisted. I couldn't figure out why because you were one of the best students I've ever had uh, then or since. So as I was a member of the HCEC, I found your folder and read the terrible letter, which pointed out how poorly you had done during your first semester, putting little value on the fact that you'd accumulated 11 A plus grades since and you were working on your honors thesis. And astonishingly, insisted on saying you were too enthusiastic about a career in medicine to be believed. To say I was horrified was to put it mildly. I brought this issue to the attention of the HCEC chair, and I found out that medical schools only got the summary letter and not the letters written by recommenders of whom I was one. The result was a change in that rule, so after that time, all letters were sent. Meanwhile, she goes on to say, I spoke with the director of admissions at the University of Cincinnati some, for some 45 minutes and made him revisit your record on the spot and also sent him a copy of my letter. To my great delight and relief, he admitted you. And as uh, then you went on to more than prove my faith in you and his faith in you. As I subsequently found out, the person who had written your summary letter did not believe that women should be doctors. So I believe he deliberately sabotaged you and may well have sabotaged other students. I cannot take credit for having the person resign from HCEC, which did not happen until sometime afterwards. But when my advisees asked whether they should choose him as an interviewer, I indicated that it wouldn't be wise. In the end, I think it's an important story and one that I'm hoping to tell at my reunion. So um, I was not even aware of this entire scenario until three years ago. 40 years after this whole entire event happened. And I think that this is a really striking example of gender bias, but equally importantly, it epitomizes the meaning of a really great mentor because without Dr. Udermullen and her behind the scenes effort, I likely wouldn't um, be in this position that I'm in today. So I really owe her you know, an incredible debt of gratitude and after I understood the whole scenario, I went back to the Cornell website under HCEC 
And I saw that it now states that for, you know, for students, the complete HCEC letter includes the letter of evaluation composed by the HCEC and two to three letters of recommendation. So without even knowing it, I changed Cornell procedure. Well, after medical school, I did my general surgery residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And every year, Dr. Judah Folkman crossed the bridge from um, Children's Hospital to the Brigham to give a talk to the interns. And as soon as I heard him speak, I knew right then and there uh, during that talk that uh, I wanted to do research in his laboratory. Unfortunately, a lot of other people had the same idea. And so it took me quite a long time to get into his laboratory, but I eventually did get into the lab. And um, in the Folkman lab, when one enters, they're assigned to um, one of several principal investigators. And I was assigned to um, a very prominent principal investigator named Dr. Michael Clagsbrun. And I don't wanna to take too much time to describe the project that I worked on, but I can suffice it to say that after two years of research in the laboratory, which were two of the most exciting years in my in, of my life, and I'm indebted every day to Dr. Folkman for accepting me into the lab. Um, after two years of research, it became evident that I had identified a new growth factor. And the uh, paper that resulted from that, which I wrote at the end of my two years in, in the lab, was published in a little known journal named Cell Regulation. Uh, subsequent work on this growth factor showed that it was actually a member of the epidermal growth factor family. And this is the paper that um, is the most commonly cited paper regarding the discovery of HBEGF. And as you'll notice, my name was not on this paper, despite the fact that some of my intellectual contributions were mentioned and shown in the paper. And um, I was gone from the lab at this time, but word came back to me that a patent was being written on this and my name wasn't on the patent. And I felt that it was really unfair for somebody that had um, made an, a, an a, you know, identified something new to not even being mentioned on the patent. Um, and unfortunately it took the hiring of a patent attorney to get the situation straightened out. And after that, my name was added to the patent. Um, but that took a lot out of me and it was very discouraging. And, um, you know, it's 30 years later now and this still bothers me. And I don't know if it was an example of gender bias, if it was the fact that I was a surgeon rather than a trained scientist, or maybe just my contributions in the lab weren't you know, recognized, I'm not sure. But I think that it shows us that we really have to be so cognizant of the effect that we have on others, of our trainees, of the people in our lab, et cetera. And so as a result of that, I made sure that every um, contribution of others in my lab were recognized in manuscripts and in patents, as you can see here. And then I, as I was preparing another talk more recently, last year, in fact, I looked up Dr. Michael Clagsburn and I was really so disheartened to see that uh, he died on May 7th of 2020. He was 81 years old and you can see in his obituary, it mentioned that he was credited with the, the discovery of um, HBEGF and he died from coronavirus. I was just absolutely uh, mortified to read this. The last time I had seen him was at Judah Folkman's funeral. And he actually came up to me and he apologized. He said he felt very badly about the way things had turned out um, and we made amends. But I, you know, this still influences me to this day. So I think that uh, this is an example of the importance of fighting for what we believe that we deserve um, in our careers. And I wanna fast forward to Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, where I've been actually for, for my whole career. And uh, I started as a faculty member there in 1991. And I give a, a, a large amount of credit to Donna Caniano, who was the chief at the time. And she really supported my research career. 
Unfortunately, we had a little snafu about two years after I got there because we had one of the most challenging town gown situations that you could imagine because two um, of our partners uh, left our practice and went into private practice right in the hospital, which was interesting. And then they recruited a third. So there were three private practitioners and then there was Donna and myself. And for two years, Donna and I took call every other night. It was like being an intern all over again. Um, but we preserved academics in uh, what was then called Columbus Children's Hospital and the program flourished after that. But I really wanna give a ton of credit to Larry Moss and you um, heard Mary and Henry mention his name earlier because Larry was really the first person who trusted um, me um, in any kind of administrative capacity. And he chose me to be the chief of the Department of Pediatric Surgery after a national search. And I have um, uh, an incredible debt to Larry Moss. Um, uh, and I think, again, it illustrates the importance of mentorship. And your mentors, it's nice if you have, a, if you have female mentors, but male mentors can be so incredibly important in our careers. And I absolutely implore all of you to find the right mentors. And it's important to have more than one mentor. One should have a clinical mentor, a research mentor, a, a mentor who can guide us in lifestyle questions and uh, personal issues. So really go out and find those mentors. Um, they're not necessarily going to find you. And the mentor-mentee relationship is a two-way street. And you can't expect them to do everything for you. You have to do a lot of the work, but it's people like Larry who really made sure that people um, like me could reach our goals and aspirations. So at the Ohio State University where I started in 1991, I was recruited um, by Olga Jonasson. And Olga, in case you don't know, you probably know of her from her time and tenure at the American College of Surgeons, but she was the first female chair of an academic department in the United States, the first female chair. And I find it amazing that there was no recognition of her leadership at OSU for the subsequent two and a half decades after she left OSU. She left in 1993 and no recognition was made until 2019. And I'm gonna tell you how that happened. In 2016, we got a new chair of the Department of Surgery at OSU and his name is Dr. Tim Pollack. And in 2019, after noticing that there was no recognition for Dr. Olga Jonasson, he established the Olga Jonasson Chair in Surgery. And he appointed Dr. Carrie Sims, who re he recruited to be the chief of the Division of Trauma, Burns and Critical Care as the first Olga Jonasson professor. And Tim Pollack, um, in the little over five years that he's been at OSU, has recruited 20 women. He's made sure that women got promoted and he's appointed them to important leadership roles in the department. And I really give him a lot of credit for that. It's another wonderful example of how male mentors can be really, really important for us. And because of all of his contributions to women in surgery, um, you may have noticed that the Association of Women Surgeons just um, put out a call for nominations for awards. And so some of the um, women at OSU, myself and a couple of others, have nominated him for the Charles Putnam Distinguished Mentorship Award at the um, Association of Women Surgeons, and I really hope he gets it. So I just want to um, finish by saying that it's really important for us as women in surgery to take chances. Nothing's going to happen with your career if you don't go out on a limb and take a chance. Um, if you haven't read the book Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO of Facebook, I would urge you to do it, uh, to read it. It's really important to take a chance. And as you heard from Mary Brandt's um, introduction today, um, we need to really make sure that our colleagues are okay. Um, you know, second victim syndrome is a real problem. 
we have complications. It's incredibly stressful, the jobs that we have, and we need to make sure that our partners okay, are okay. And as women in surgery, we have to stick up for each other. So I'll just um, end on that. I wanna thank um, the organizers for asking me to speak tonight. The other uh, stories were so inspirational and hopefully we have some time for questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for everyone who spoke. I love learning the stories of every pediatric surgeon more than just what's written on the paper. So thank you for sharing those with us. A couple, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. If not, uh, I've got a couple that had come other ways. So one question was, in the setting of job transition, so someone was interested in hearing some thoughts about whenever a job ends and it wasn't an amicable departure, either you left because it was unhealthy or you were asked to leave, how best to respond to the question of how did it end or a question of why have you been jumping around? Um, I can maybe uh, start. Um, you know, somebody wise once said to me that when you um, leave a, a position, there's always a push and there's always a pull. And they may not be symmetrical, but I think it's a good way um, to think about your job transitions. And um, so when you, if you've left somewhere and it's not amicable, nonetheless, there were reasons why you went there. And um, there were probably um, things that you learned and uh, maybe small successes, not enough to keep you there, um, but enough so that you took something away from that experience. And by the same token, you're allowed to feel excited about a job that you don't have yet. Um, you know, that's still in the headlights for you and maybe part of your future. And so I'd urge you to think about transitions that way, um, because that's really true. There's very few um, experiences that we have professionally um, that are purely black or purely white. Most of them um, involve some degree of change, some of which is exciting and some of which is terrifying and some of which is experienced positively and some not so much. Um, so I think that that's how I would approach that question. Thank you. Any other thoughts from the group? All right. I think, I think that for many, one of the um, perhaps only ways to move up in your career is to leave your institution and um, go out on a limb. And as I said, you know, earlier, take a chance, don't be afraid to do it, do what's best for your career, um, irrespective of what, I've, what the change is and go for it, take a chance. Sounds good. I think um, you know, what you said about focusing on what you learned, you went there for a reason and highlight what you got, what your gut told you to go get and what you got from that, even though it may not have been what you were expecting 100%. Um, the next question that we have was for Dr. Henry. Um, the question is, what was it that made you realize that you had to reevaluate things and find a coach to refocus her life and career and make a change? And what advice would you have for helping people discover that time and the new path going forward? She just turned off her video, so I have a feeling oh, okay. that as a kid bugging her, maybe jump to a different question. Oh, here sure. she comes. I'm okay. sorry, I missed the question. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's Aaron okay. figured out the situation. <laughs> I'm <laughs> having the same thing. <laughs> the question was, what was it that made you realize that you had to reevaluate things and find a coach to refocus your life and career and make, <laughs> make a change in what you were doing? Kid? Um, you know, it really wasn't any one thing. Um, I actually, uh, when we shut down for for COVID, to be honest, I was a little bored. There wasn't a whole lot that I could do. We didn't immediately redeploy into new positions. And so um, I decided to, to get coach training for myself through um, a friend who's an orthopedic surgeon in San Diego, Jeff Smith. 
And it was in the process of learning about coaching that, and actually um, meeting a coach who he had come and speak to us, that I decided to have a conversation with her for my own coaching session. And we met for actually three separate sessions. And during that session, during those sessions, it kind of suddenly really became a like, she could tell that I was sort of on edge and that something wasn't right. And she, um, in the course of sort of our conversations, we, she asked questions that made me really realize um, I, I needed a change. I wanted something different. Um, and so, um, but it wasn't, there was no driving force. Everything was actually fine. It was just a, I'm going to do this thing to sort of find something new for me. And then that led to, well, what is it that you really want to do? And that led to the soul searching that, that sort of came up with that answer. All right. And then the last question would be, whenever obstacles are come upon, sometimes we kind of isolate ourselves and hide. And so I was curious to know, one, how do you recognize that in yourself and make plans? Or if you see your partners or other people kind of going down that pathway, what are the gentle ways to bring them back? I think sometimes, um, at I, I know this about a couple of my friends. Um, and I think if you know that about people, then it's um, really good to recognize when it's happening and to reach out. And I have a couple friends who definitely withdraw from conversations. You know, we stop hearing from them. And that's when I realize something is up. And in those situations, it's sort of having, going that extra, taking that extra step reaching out that extra, that extra mile, making that phone call, doing that private text, not the group text, you know, is something okay. It's um, reading nuances in posts on social media. You know, I, I had a call late the other night about someone uh, from a friend who said, did you read the same thing I did or am I overreacting? And I said, no. I think you're not overreacting. I read the, I read between the lines there too. And, you know, I think we should reach out. Um, so that, that's my, that's my take and my suggestion. Any other words of wisdom before we transition on to breakout rooms? I wanna advocate for um, peer mentorship too. Um, I think that obviously finding, you know, mentors who have walked the path is great, but finding people who are just at the same level that you are, that you can um, figure out if what you're feeling is right or, you know, um, if they're doing the same things is really important. And, you know, we, um, lots of us around are, are here if there's anybody who needs anything, but, um, you know, sometimes that's just the best thing is to have somebody who is, you know, around you that can um, check in on you. I mean, I have some amazing partners, most of who are on this call, um, who check in on me when um, I'm, you know, not myself and I hope I do the same thing for them. And I think that that can really help us all. Yeah, I think you what you bring up is normalizing it, you know, so I think that's really important in the the path to leading you down to isolation is when you feel like it's only you, like this is only happening to me. And these are only, you know, a little why me, but a little also like, where's everybody else? And if you're not taking on to those friends who are reaching out to you, you can really get far down that path. So I think what you bring up is normalizing and acknowledging kind of what's there and finding others who are going through the same thing with you and then someone just one step ahead to show you the way. You know, um, many of us filled out the survey about um, peer support and second victim syndrome and Lauren Berman at the um, 
Association of Training Program Directors meeting today shared some of those results. And I think that, you know, when our partners experience an untoward event, we um, often feel that they probably don't want to talk about it. They really don't, you know, want you to reach out to them. And it's really quite the opposite. And I think 80% of people who responded, or more than that, um, said that, you know, they wish that when they had complications, people would have reached out to them. So, you know, again, be kind to your partners, always, you know, put yourself in their place. And when you hear about these complications, the first thing I think is, well, that could have easily happened to me. And so empathy and understanding is really important and reach out and see if they want to talk about it. Cause in general, they probably do want to talk about it. And at children's hospital, we have started, um, you know, a peer support group for people that um, want to volunteer and be peer supporters for our colleagues. And I think it's really important that everybody, no matter what level of training they're at, you know, junior people, mid-level and senior people, hopefully should know that they have somebody to talk to who's going to be non-judgmental and will just listen. Sometimes it just takes somebody to listen. That's a hard skill to learn, I think, to just listen. We're so used to providing answers. But I do, I think that peer support is really great. The session they had last year was really eye-opening and, and something that I think we'll hear more of in the coming times. Um, I like to assume best intent with what anybody is doing, no matter what the outcome is. And I think that puts a little light, makes it feel a little lighter when you just assume they were doing the best they could do, no matter what actually happened. Um, well, with that, let's go ahead and get into breakout rooms. If you wanna put in your rename where you're um, currently located, you can, or if you wanna put in how to contact you, the email, phone number, whatever you feel like you, um, you can do that. And we'll have 10 to 15 minutes in our groups and you'll see something pop up to say join breakout room and just click yes if you'd like to go. Welcome back everyone. I love to see all the kids who have been popping into the pictures. It's been great to see so many people here tonight and to see so many of our male colleagues joining us for a Benji Brooks event. So, um, you know, we welcome you all and it's so great. So, I mean, we've had, we had over a dozen men uh, participate, which is the most we've had any year, I think. And so, uh, Casey, Doug, um, I know Ron was here earlier. I don't know who's here still, Mark. Um, it's just really great to have you join. And so thank you. That's right, Marilyn, it was. It used to always be Alex Holler and that was it every meeting. Because he would get the lunch. <laughs> Maybe that was why he, he would line up with us and say, how come I'm the only one here, but there's lunch. And so he would just... <laughs> Come in for the lunch. But he stayed for, he was always there. <laughs> we should call it the Alex Haller lunch. When we, whenever we come together, we should call the, the lunch itself. It's the Benji the Brooks lunch part. Meeting. The, Alex the Haller lunch part. Or, or we could have the Alex Haller salad. Yeah, the Alex Haller salad. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for joining us in this session. It was such a privilege to hear the inspiring stories of Dr. Besner and Dr. Henry and Dr. Newman. Uh, we wanna thank them very much for taking the time to join us today. And we would additionally like to invite our participants to follow our Facebook page and private Facebook groups. Both are named Benji Brooks, Supporting Women in Pediatric Surgery. We are also promoting women in pediatric surgery on social media using Twitter and Facebook. So this month's highlights are the AAPI surgeons and please, please let us know if there's someone you would like to see highlighted. All right, any, if there are any other questions, feel free to reach out on any of those. You can reach out to anybody who spoke today um, or via the Facebook group and someone will be happy to, to get back to you. I can't wait for how connected we're going to continue to become over, over the coming months and years and our careers. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks everyone. It was great to see you all. I wish we could uh, do a great big group hug. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Take care of yourself and be well. Absolutely.